Welcome to the June edition of the European Urology Podcast. My name is Declan Murphy, urologist here in Melbourne. I'm speaking to you from the GUCAS studio. GUCAS provide the production facilities for the European Urology Podcast. I'm on my own this month. My co-host Joyce Bard is enjoying some time off in Europe, so I wish her all the very best and we look forward to having her back soon again. Coming up this month, we've selected two of our favourite papers in this month's edition of the European Urology Podcast. One focuses on PSMA PET and non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Our second paper is a systematic review of thulium versus holmium lasers for stone surgery, which is the best. Then we go to one of our senior trainees who's going to have a look at what else caught her eye in the journal this month. And finally, did you ever wonder what the statistical editors are thinking when they have a look at your manuscript coming into European Urology? Well, stay tuned. We're having a chat with Rodney Dunn, one of our senior statistical editors here at the Journal to get his insights into their role as statistical editors. Let's get going. So for our first paper in this month's edition of the European Urology Podcast, uh, we're talking about one of our favourite topics on GUCast, actually, our uh, our parent podcast for the European Urology Podcast. This is PSMA. Um, this is uh, an updated paper looking at the role of PSMA PET-CT in patients with high-risk non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, an international multicenter retrospective study. Uh, and we're very pleased to welcome senior author Boris Hadishik, who is a friend of G. UCAST actually. Boris has been here in our studio in Melbourne a few months ago uh, talking about high-risk prostate cancer. He's a urologist, the chief of urology um, in Essen in Germany. And we're also joined by uh, Caroline Goffin, who is a very well-known nuclear medicine physician and expert in this area uh, from the Catholic University in Leuven. Um, Boris and Caroline, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Well, it's great to see you both. Um, So as ever on the European Urology Podcast, we're not going to do a very um, in-depth presentation of this paper. The links are in the show notes and we encourage you to go and read it. And actually, this one is one of our brief correspondence papers in European Urology. No excuses. This is very easy to read and it is important. Um, I'll give you by way of background from my perspective as a clinician interested in this area, um, the history of this, because um, when these non-metastatic CRPC uh, studies started coming out in the past couple of years. Um, It was identifying quite a a niche population uh, of patients who had been on ADT. They'd now become castration resistant, so their PSA was rising. But on conventional imaging staging, they were M0, no visible metastases. And what three pivotal studies showed us is that if you uh, take these patients and offer them a potent AR pathway inhibitor like enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, all three of them tested in three different very large phase three studies, uh, we improved uh, the time to metastases and indeed the time to overall survival in subsequent papers. Uh, But this was based on conventional imaging. So at that time, in many countries, PSMA PET-CT was becoming more widely available. And an obvious question was, well, what about if you do a PET scan for these CRPC patients with fast rising PSAs, the, the study population for this? Um, so Boris and his international colleagues uh, back then in 2019, I think the original paper uh, came out, um, tried to get a similar group of patients, a group of patients who had high risk non-metastatic CRPC. So the PSAs were doubling in less than 10 months, very much like the, the study populations for these, uh, these three pivotal studies um, and tried to find out which patients had had a PET scan and what it showed. So that was the background and that was an interesting paper. Maybe we'll talk about those findings first. And then this very interesting updated paper is reporting overall survival in the same cohort. So Boris, um, uh, I hope I didn't um, uh, misalign any of the findings from your study, but please, yeah, give us a give us a, a top line summary of this uh, updated paper. Yeah, so thank you very much, Declan. Thank you very much on behalf of the whole group. It's really an international study uh, with people from Melbourne and patients from Melbourne included as well. So um, in 2019, we showed that if you use better imaging, you in fact do see distant metastases in roughly half of the patient population with uh, um, population with high risk non-metastatic 
uh, CRPC on conventional imaging. So you see much more, but uh, uh, at that time, we then tried to look whether we can identify a subgroup of patients that would not benefit from intensified uh, treatment with one of the novel agents you just mentioned, and we were not able to do so. So in the end, we had uh, a great imaging tool, but uh, the question was unanswered whether this imaging really predicted outcome. So here now in the update of the same 200 patients we described uh, in 2019, we now um, were able to, to look at overall survival events, so our hardest oncologic endpoint. And um, in fact, all the PETs were read um, in a standardized fashion. I think that is very important. We used the PROMISE criteria to read the PET scans. And we were able to show that um, results on PSMA PET at the time of M0 CRPC predicted overall survival. Mm -hmm. So patients with more than five metastases on PET had worse overall survival, so they lived shorter. And similarly, patients with very high intensity on PSMA PET um, lived shorter. So um, PSMA PET at one time point predicted outcome of our patients. On the, at the same time, we also looked whether that uh, PSMA PET really influenced subsequent treatment, and certainly it did. So we had a little bit more metastasis-directed treatment in patients with local recurrence or oligometastasis only, uh, and we had more systemic treatment in those patients with metastases. Um, but in the end, the most important message of this updated paper now is that imaging really correlates with outcome. And I think this is very important. And this is has been a theme that we, uh, as a group, uh, continue to explore a little bit further by using standardized imaging and correlating that with outcome to be able to really not only make beautiful, colorful images, but to, to be able to group our patients into risk groups to, to decide which patient maybe does not need intensified treatment, which patient needs really extra care also in the follow-up because he's more likely to events earlier. And so this is uh, um, something that now has to be explored uh, in prospective studies as well. And I'm thankful that uh, many of the new studies that are now um, recruiting patients really do start to integrate PSMA PET uh, as in the follow-up and some even as primary endpoint in the study. So I think um, it is really standardized PET reading provides us biologic information and therefore we should value it. Wow, totally agree. And because it's always been a slightly um, sceptical or hesitant uh, reaction to some of the guideline communities is that, yes, although PSMA PET has greater accuracy, greater specificity, especially in this population, how do we know it changes future management or improves outcomes? Um, Caroline, uh, what are your thoughts on this? You have a very high volume PSMA PET program in Leuven. Um, what, what's your reaction to this updated paper? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting paper and it, it offers again one of these important stepping stones that we need for the, the real implementation of PSMA, but at yet, yet another uh, clinical stage. So I think we've seen the use in primary staging biochemical recurrence. Also there, there were some hesitance in the beginning. I think we've shown that there is also prognostic value in the, uh, in the images in these uh, settings. And this is again a new clinical uh, scenario where uh, where this paper uh, hints to uh, the, the point that it's not, ju not just about seeing lesions, but actually these lesions have a prognostic value for patients. We need to, to tailor our treatments to, the, to, the, to what we see on the images. So I think it's, uh, again, a very important stepping stone, and I'm really looking forward to prospective trials and, and, and other large registries that will shed more light on to the, the real uh, prognostic uh, and predictive value of our images. Totally agree. Uh, have you any particular questions for Boris while we have him here uh, in front of us about this uh, study? Yeah, so I, I have a, a question. So it's great to see that it's an international um, uh, cohort of patients that has been recruited. How did you account for different tracers or different scan protocols that were used in the different sites? So that's a certainly excellent question. Uh, and so we had uh, double reads of the scans, and I think we broke it down to the promise criteria. And the promise <clears throat> criteria, they don't depend on the tracer. So it's really standardized reading of what you see on the images. And uh, 
there's certainly variation if you try in a retrospective fashion quantify SUV values there might be debate about the different protocols but just seeing what you see uh, is not that difficult now with some of the the, the newer tracers like um, the PSMA 1007 yeah um, that might be a little bit more hard to read uh, with uh, regards to unspecific bone uptake. Um, most of the patients here in this study from 2019 and now with the update were imaged with uh, gallium PSMA 11. So uh, the tracer that we know the best. And so there's not a lot of variation in there, but uh, the data that um, Wolfgang from our group on nuclear medicine uh, vice chair presented at ASCO uh, was using different tracers, including fluorinated tracers, and uh, they're spanning the, the whole spectrum of prostate cancer from primary staging to late stage MCFPC. We were also able to, to really point out that standardized PET reporting is predictive of overall survival outcomes. And so this really is something where we should value PSMA PET. And in my personal opinion, we discussed this before in Declan, I mean, if you have to decide at what time point in prostate cancer you use PSMA PET, if you have it available, um, I, I personally believe that primary staging and patient selection before radioligand therapy are the sweet spots right now. Uh, and uh, this M0 CFPC niche is kind of the, the, the least important uh, indication for myself when prescribing a PET scan. I agree. Uh, with I you. think it's very important that what you mentioned too about standardized reporting. This is something that you do very well in the, the trials from Essen, but it's something that also within the nuclear medicine field we should really embrace and use in our clinical routine. We have implemented it here in Leuven, it went quite well. So I encourage all colleagues to also in clinical routine really use uh, these criteria to report your PSMA imaging. So this is the promise criteria I think you refer to, Caroline. Yes, and, um, indeed, yes. So promise, for, promise version two, yes. Promise version two. So for, for listeners and viewers out there who are not familiar with this, uh, can Caroline or one of you explain a bit about what is promise and, and should we be knocking on the door of our nuclear medicine physicians to make sure they're using it? Yeah, I think you so, should. Yes. So it, it is a standardized reporting system that that's very well suitable for Im for image reporting going from primary staging to all the way up to the metastatic uh, castration resistant prostate cancer stage. It's quite easy to implement. Um, there's a, an excellent paper that uh, that describes the different steps that you need to take. Um, so it is really something that if your nuclear medicine physicians are not using yet, you should en encourage them to look at the paper and implement it in clinical routine. Yeah, and the beauty is version two, which is the current version has been published in European Urology last year. So by Seifert et al, uh, we will yes. put it in the footnotes, I guess. Yeah, we can. We can put a link to the Promise paper. Uh, these are all very helpful. And I really like that simple message that regardless of the tracer that you're using, the Promise criteria, um, especially in a study like this current one, has been shown to be a kind of a, a leveler. It doesn't really matter what you're using, which tracer you're using, as long as it's one that your department has expertise with, and then you apply a standardized reporting system on top of it. So maybe yes. one one comment uh, I'm allowed to to take. So now we have implemented, or Wolfgang has implemented, the Promise Registry, where we really again in a global effort collect data. Um, we presented uh, now at ASCO 1600 patients. The paper coming out a little bit later this year will include 2,400. But from I have the report from today. Now we have 4,800 patients in that registry. And if you have, as a listener, a strong um, nuclear medicine department and want to participate in that registry that's really looking about standardized imaging and survival outcomes, then uh, you can contact us and be, become part of the PROMS registry. Uh, our goal is to have 10,000 patients by the end of this year. And then we really can show that uh, across various entities in prostate cancer, we can predict meaningful outcome. And then the next step certainly is to, to link not only imaging, but clinical data to improve our risk prediction. Excellent. So good to hear. Uh, so contact Boris or Wolfgang Fendler at Essen uh, if your department would like to join the Promise Registry. Finally, Boris, a question I have for you is in this typical scenario of the non-metastatic CRPC, the PSA is rising, whether they've had conventional imaging or not, very often they'll have a PSMA PET, 
and they might have low volume disease, oligometastatic disease, a few spots here and there. And in an era where stereotactic radiation is becoming more widely available, it's very well tolerated. People might sometimes be tempted to do some stereotactic radiation to these one or two nodes or bone metastases. That's certainly what can happen in a country like Australia instead of using these uh, AR pathway inhibitors that have an overall survival benefit. What's your sense on the role of metastasis-directed therapy in this population, especially as in this study you stratify between the lower volume metastases and the so-called polymetastases? What, what's the role of metastasis-directed therapy? So it's, it's uh, yeah, you're putting your finger in the sweet spot. My argument would be you should have used the PSMA PET in hormone-sensitive recurrence because I think there the window of uh, or the opportunity of cure is higher, although already in hormone-sensitive biochemical recurrence with a short PSA doubling time, we have learned that by metastasis-directed treatment, we are only curing a fraction of patients. You can delay hormonal interventions maybe, and that is the glass half full or half empty. It depends on the patient and your discussion with him. Um, in M0CRPC, so after they already had ADT, now they have a short PSA doubling time, I think systemic treatment is the way to go. In hormone sensitive disease, I, I really do like using a PET, uh, but I also acknowledge the Embark study and its data that even there for short PSA doubling times, systemic treatment can make a difference. But the beauty of Embark is that they had a treatment holiday uh, if the PSA is responding very nicely. So what I do in clinical practice, I'm very strict, but I certainly do offer MDT but most of the time in combination with good systemic treatment. And then if the PSA is going away, I discuss to stop treatment after a certain period of time. I, I, I like that point that although we're talking about non-metastatic CRPC, you're bringing us back to the, to the idea that the real value is in the initial staging and in maybe biochemical recurrence. Uh, finally, Carolyn, in your centre in Leuven, uh, in what clinical scenario uh, are your clinicians using PSMA PET-CT? So we, we we use it most in, in biochemical recurrent setting and then also more and more in the primary staging of high-risk patients, of course, also to select patients for a, for a PSMA-based radioligand therapy. And then we also get uh, some uh, some scans for uh, everything in between. So, uh, but this is not uh, this is not the, these are not the main indications that we scan. So these three are are, are the majority of what we scan on a daily basis. Well, terrific. It's a niche area, as you say, Boris, but nonetheless, it's uh, great to see this paper in European Urology. Congratulations uh, to you and all your international colleagues, including my own colleagues here at Peter Mack in Melbourne, uh, to Manuel Weber, uh, who published it. And maybe the learnings are not so much for this niche area of high-risk non-metastatic CRPC, but the broader indications, the use of standardized variables, and of course, uh, to encourage us to be enrolling patients in the Promise Registry. Um, congratulations again to all your colleagues, and thank you very much for joining us. So for our second paper this month, I'm really pleased to say we're not talking about cancer. Um, it's a common criticism we hear among the European Urology Editor Group uh, that European Urology has too much oncology. Um, it's probably just a, a nature of the success of the journal is that these oncology papers tend to attract a lot of citations. But we're always very, very happy in the journal uh, when we can accept a non-oncology paper. And this second paper we're talking about this month is a great example. This is a stone uh, paper. It's a system review and meta-analysis of the uh, Thulium laser versus the Holmium la laser uh, for stone surgery. So, you know, this is a really hot topic. This is a very common topic uh, in general urology, uh, even though myself personally, uh, I only do GU oncology. I pretty much only do prostate cancer. So you'll, you'll have to forgive me as I welcome our guest on the line, senior author uh, Esteban Emiliani, uh, uh, Emiliani from the uh, Fundatio Poigwerk Center in Barcelona uh, to talk us through this. Um, Emil, uh, Esteban, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us on the European Urology Podcast. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, my I'm apologies. Very proud to represent the stone community here. Yeah, he says, go, go the stone community. Let's have more <laughs> yeah. stone papers in European urology. <laughs> and and look, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, I'm afraid um, I, I, we were scheduled to have uh, an eminent stone uh, surgeon joining us for the discussion today. But instead, you've got me, um, a prostate cancer specialist. So um, uh, please, listeners and viewers, bear with me. Don't worry. I'm not going to talk very much about this. I have read the paper and I've got a few simple questions, but we'll be relying on Esther 
Mr. Byrne's expertise uh, to talk us through this paper. And as ever, um, we're not going to go into great detail in the presentation of the paper and the results. The links are in the show notes and we really encourage people to go and read this very nice systematic review. But we will ask you, Esteban, just to give us a, a top line summary of this, uh, of this study and your findings. Okay, so what we wanted to do is to compare the main literature uh, regarding homium laser and its main competitor, tritium fiber laser, that has been here for only five to uh, five years, compared to the 20 years that or more than we have used homium laser. So, of course, there's um, only few data on the literature. There's no many uh, randomized controlled trials, but still we did this great meta-analysis and our main findings um, were on stone free rate which uh, favors thudium fiber laser that was um, pretty good we also already saw that in in vitro studies so this um, showed this um, statistically significant um, let's say better stone free rate and in some let's say in some subgroup analysis superiority of TFN. That was not the case on uh, stones in the ureter. It, it was the, that was the case on stone and kidneys. Operative time and laser time were uh, the same, but, but also a superiority when you use, select some subgroup analysis. And laser time and complications were the same. So uh, we showed this superiority uh, towards uh, thulium fiber laser and that was, um, let's say, the, the greatest conclusion of the of the uh, study. It's quite a strong conclusion, isn't it, for stone surgeons out there, for somebody investing in a laser or upgrading their laser? Is this data showing that the, the thulium laser has some superiority for stone-free rates? But there are some limitations, of course, uh, every time we do a systematic review, um, including, of course, the lack of randomized trials. Can you talk to us a bit about the, the limitations and how that might affect the conclusion? Because it, it is quite a strong conclusion that the, mm -hmm. the thulium is superior. Yeah, absolutely. So that's obviously our main um, limitation. There's only four randomized control trials in this. Uh, one was, um, let's say there's two big randomized control trials that we all know in this community. One is the one from Norway, from Ulvik, that compared TFN to homium YAG, but the 30 watt homium YAG, the low power homium YAG. And the other one was the... Um, was from the group of Wisconsin, from Stephen Nakata, who compared TFL with high-power homing lasers with pulse modulation. Yeah, and the results were completely different. While the Norwegian randomized controlled trial showed a really increased stone-free rate for TFL, the one that used high-power laser and pulse modulation didn't show any 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 differences and we saw that in our subgroup analysis also so um, there's still a lot of, to learn we need a lot a lot more data to really um, conclude this and to for the, for this to be a, a strong conclusion but at least with all the data that we have the retros even the retrospective studies and I know this is a limitation but the uh, it really showed a tendency towards um, TFL. And also the other thing is the definition of stone-free can impact uh, the findings as well. Um, and we know in stone surgery, it's, it's common to have terms like minimally uh, residual, minimally significant residual fragments and so on. Can you tell us a bit about the definition of stone-free rates in this uh, systematic review? Yeah, that was, that was also a problem because um, we haven't got any standardized stone free rate definition for all our studies, uh, and that's a problem. Now the community has learned about this, and we consider stone free in the big majority zero fragment, so there's no residuals, and we don't consider uh, clinically insignificant residual fragments or fragments less than two millimeters, there's actually no consensus about clinically insignificant residual fragments. So if we gather all of those um, definitions and we said residual fragments less than two millimeters can be accepted, TFL show us superiority uh, over holmium. But if we consider only zero fragment, 
versus residual fragment, there was a superiority towards TFL, but no, it was not statistically significant. So that's another thing that we that we need to have into consideration. The randomized control trial from Ulvik, for example, they were very strict on zero fragment, and they did show um, um, uh, a better results with TFL. So we need to have that into consideration for our results. And then what about the location of the stones? Because you you are using these lasers in uh, the ureter, uh, within the renal pelvis, mm -hmm. um, ureteroscopic approaches versus PCNL approaches. Were there any differences in the findings? Because I know you looked at that separately within your, your forest plots. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for kidney, TFL was superior to homium, but not for the ureter. That was, th this is something that uh, even comparing low power and high power, this is something that we had seen in the past. For the ureter, it's it's always uh, very, not a very simple, but, but a very straightforward um, indication and a very straightforward surgery. Rather than in the in the kidney, it may change, it may vary along, um, and it may vary if you have different technologies or different um, approaches, and at the end, yeah, for the kidney, it favored TFL. All well, good news for TFL all around. Um, and can mm -hmm. I ask you, is there a, a big dif difference in costs or in infrastructure required if someone's acquiring a thulium laser versus a holmium laser? Are there a few different manufacturers or is the thulium uh, all provided by one manufacturer? What are the, the practical implementations of using of choosing one mm -hmm. laser versus another laser? So homium laser, it depends on which homium laser they use. If, the, if you're using a low power homium laser, there's no big differences because it's a low power machine. You can plug it anywhere. It's very easy to, to manage. If you're using a high power homium laser, this represents a, um, an inconvenience because sometimes you need even to build up a 40 amp plug in the, in the, in the OR and it's, it's, this sometimes require even some changes in your OR infrastructure. Rather, uh, compared to the TFL, which is a very, let's say, um, efficient machine in terms of energetically, energetically efficient machine. You can plug it anywhere. There's no um, big uh, water cooling system. It's only an air system cooling. You can, there's no mirrors inside the, the laser, so you can move it all around without a fear of damaging. The laser, the homium laser is very fragile compared to TFL. So this is something also that it may help, let's say, if you have a busy infrastructure to, to manage. Excellent. And finally, uh, in, in your mm -hmm. center in Barcelona, uh, Esteban, um, do you have access to both of these lasers or one or the other? What's your, your own personal experience or your personal view uh, if you're acquiring a new laser? Yes. So that, um, I have, I'm very lucky. I have, um, I have access to both. I have a TFL and a high power home uh, laser. And if you're asking my personal experience, what I do is uh, as follows. I use almost almost exclusively TFL for flexible urethroscopy. Um, if I need to treat a cysteine stone or a brucheite or calcium phosphate stone, I'd rather go with holmium. TFL is not perfect. I, I use high power holmium laser. Uh, for urethral stones, I use TFL, but at, at very low um, energy and frequency settings because TFL has also the capability of more coagulation rather than cutting as homium laser. So sometimes if I have difficult urethral stones or impact uh, or encrusted stones, I rather use homium. So I have managed to use both in my clinical practice, and I choose the best one for for what the patient for what the patient needs. So that's what I do. 
And look, I think that your data partly shows that that whichever laser you have access to, um, they seem to have very high stone free rates anyway, mm. and low complications. And maybe a lot of it is down yeah. to what you have access to yourself for your own personal experience. And so that data is all very reassuring, uh, but certainly a very nice systematic review. Um, uh, uh, we welcome your uh, contribution and the conclusions, Esteban, and we congratulate you and all your co-authors uh, for doing this you know, very nice systematic review and getting a great publication in Europe in urology I'm, I'm sure you're all very pleased about that no oh, yes that was that was great this is you know this is the the biggest paper in our community so for what for us was um was very very we were very enthusiastic and before we end i want to give a big shout out to dr uleri was what which is the first author of this of this paper who did the main uh, let's say uh, work of this study and the whole team that helped us with all the let's say with all the um, making of the paper the design the reviews uh well especially dr uleri who deserves this big shout out Congratulations, Alessandro. Uh, thank you very much, Esteban, for joining us. And yes, everybody loves stones. Let's have more stones papers uh, in European urology. Congratulations again. So there you go. Uh, a fascinating discussion about stones. Alice, you didn't think you'd hear me talking about stones on a podcast, did you? No, I never thought I'd see the day. Well, hopefully there are still a few listeners and viewers with us. Um, but that was a great discussion with Esteban and congratulations to him and his colleagues for that nice systematic review. Um, our next segment is always very popular on the European Urology podcast. That's where we ask one of our senior trainees from somewhere around the world uh, to have a look at what else caught his or her eye in the journal this month. And I've actually got someone in studio, one of our own uh, trainees or aspiring trainees here in Australia. Dr. Alice Thompson has joined me here in the GU CAS studio. Hello, Alice. Hi, Declan. Thank you very much for joining us. So we've asked Alice to have a look at um, the, what else we have in the June edition of the European Urology podcast to see what caught her eye. So what caught your eye, Alice? Well, we have three papers that have caught my eye this, this issue. Uh, the first paper is from the European Association of Urology Robotic Kidney Transplant Group, headed by Alberto Breda. And this is looking at robotic-assisted uh, orthotopic kidney transplantation. Mm. So this was a cohort of 16 patients from a prospectively maintained database who underwent robotic-assisted orthotopic kidney transplant across three referral centres. The first thing I'd say about this paper is that it's got a really nice description of the surgical technique and there's a really great accompanying video that I urge you guys to check out. Oh, it's yeah, really surgery beautiful. in motion section. Mm. Yeah, we love yeah, that. It's great. Uh, so this technique opens up uh, the possibility of having a, uh, a kidney transplant to a patient group who might not be suitable for heterotopic transplantation due to medical comorbidities or previous surgery. And I guess it really highlights the beauty of the robotic surgical technique in reducing operative morbidity, particularly for this patient group who is so highly comorbid as well. That being said, it's a pretty niche patient group. Um, there's only 16 patients in over 4,800 mm -hmm. transplants that this group has done. Um, and perhaps it's only applicable for those specialty centres, but really beautiful video accompanying it. Very nice. Congratulations to Alberto Breda and group. And Alberto is the chair of the EAU robotic urology section. Mm. Uh, he's very, very experienced in open and robotic surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know he's been running courses at the Orsi Institute mm. in Belgium on exactly this. So okay. it's something that's been um, not rushed through. I think it's been very carefully thought through. And um, yes. and I think your final point is, is absolutely correct. I mean, this is for highly selected patients in a very specialized center. But nonetheless, if this is something that you are interested in, uh, please have a look at this paper in European Urology. The links are here in the show notes and particularly that video. Mm. Uh, Surgery in Motion is a very popular section mm. of the journal for us surgeons, isn't it? And, yeah, and uh, that is a beautiful video that um, Alberto and his team have put together. So yeah, yeah. that's great. I like that one, Alice. Uh, what else? Uh, the second paper I took a look at was um, from UCSF's Matt Cooperberg, looking at the long-term prostate cancer specific mortality after prostatectomy, brachytherapy, external beam radiation, hormonal therapy, or monitoring for localized prostate cancer. So this is a cohort study uh, looking at the multi-center prospective database capture. And it included over 11,000 men with biopsy proven localized prostate cancer, enrolled between 1995 and 2022. 
Overall, the findings were that survival for men with low-risk tumours was high, regardless of what treatment they had or if they were on surveillance. Um, but men with high-risk treatment, uh, high-risk disease, pardon me, definitely benefited from having treatment. And in good news for surgeons everywhere, the best survival outcomes were for for high-risk disease was seen in men who had radical prostatectomy as their first-line treatment. Very good. So capture. I remember uh, capture when I was um, a trainee, when I was uh, getting on to training like you yourself, and Matt was in his training, and uh, himself and his big boss. Uh, Peter Carl had set up the Capture database and some really important data came out of it. And here we are years and years later, uh, I suppose, getting the benefit Mm. of a well set up database to answer some questions for us. So so what's my take on this? I think it's very reassuring, number one, for men with low risk disease who can be Mm. surveyed and and the UCSF group, Peter Carl and co., were uh, at the very forefront in the US, at least, of of using active surveillance Mm -hmm. for patients and Capture has shown us that. Uh, And second, yes, I mean, it it does give very good detail about management for high-risk disease. Uh, And of course, that's a a hot potato of a topic. It comes up all the time, surgery versus radiation. And I think what's reassuring is we see very good data for local treatment for high-risk prostate cancer, whether that is surgery or radiation. We probably can't state too much more than that. But um, And I should say congratulations to Annika Herleman. I can see she was the first author on that. Um, I know she's a a very talented uh, trainee at the time Mm -hmm. from Germany who went over and spent time with Matt and Co. before she went back to Munich. Uh, and so. okay. Very good. Uh, so we've had kidney transplantation, we've had um, prostate cancer outcomes. What else have you got? Well, I've got some more prostate cancer okay. for you, Declan. Good, thank you. Uh, so the third and final paper that I've chosen is the SATIN trial from Amir Kishan at UCLA. And this was a single arm phase two trial with 26 patients to evaluate whether the addition of dual antiandrogen therapy plus intermittent ADT plus metastasis-directed therapy using SAVA reduces the rates uh, of recurrence for men with oligometastatic prostate cancer Mm. uh, with disease on PSMA PET after radical prostatectomy. Okay. So patients receive six months of ADT plus apalutamide and abiaterone and prednisolone and uh, SAVA of up to five different lesions. The primary endpoint was undetectable PSA six months after testosterone recovery, um, which was achieved by half the patients, which met their primary endpoint. However, grade three toxicity was 21%. And so whilst treatment intensification may may improve long-term outcomes, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion to have with patients about what they'll tolerate in terms of the risks and what benefits they can get. So, uh, and Amr, I should say, is uh, one of our associate editors on European Urology. He looks after our radiation oncology section and he's been on the podcast. Uh, Congrats, Amr, to you and your team. Um, So this is men who've had a radical prostatectomy and they've got oligometastatic recurrence Mm -hmm. up to five lesions on a PET scan. Mm -hmm. Um, But then they've had a lot of treatment. They've had Mm -hmm. ADT plus apalutamide plus abiraterone and steroids plus Mm Sabre. Um, I must, you know, that's a group of patients where we sometimes try and uh, de-intensify mm. a bit by, 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 you know, perhaps only using Sabre mm-hmm. uh, to maybe uh, avoid or, you know, delay the need for ADT on its own, let alone ADT plus all the other stuff. So mm. it's an interesting approach, isn't it? This intensification, de-intensification, lovely to see a phase two prospective study on it. Um, and I suppose a lot of it is up to what patients accept as mm. well in terms of perhaps some benefit but there's a price in terms of even just the amount of medication and the the grade three toxicity which i presume is stuff like rash and hypertension and stuff like that Mm -hmm. it'll be from the the systemic treatments not the saber i suppose yes and that's what they found exactly yeah um and i know there is a nice editorial written by um uh, gert de mirlier uh steven johnio and others about this and i think they talk a little bit about that balance don't they between intensification and de-intensification exactly yes there was a lot in the journal this month. A lot. I have to say, so when myself and um, uh, Briganti uh, uh, try and select ahead of time which two papers we highlight, um, sometimes two will kind of suddenly, you know, be very obvious to us. I, I was a real struggle this month. Mm, a um, issue. And, uh, and it was great to get stones in and great to have these other highlights. So um, thanks very much, Alice, for popping in. Thank you so much for having me. Very good. So as regular listeners and viewers will know, uh, occasionally we like to track down some of our senior editors at European Urology to have a chat with them about their role, uh, because I know many of the audience are interested in knowing how, how does it work and how can I get my paper accepted or how can I stop getting rejected all the time? Uh, so it's a great privilege to welcome uh, Rod Dunn, Professor Rod Dunn, who's one of our senior statistical editors on the journal, who's here at the EAU um, uh, visiting over from uh, Michigan. So great from to Michigan, see you, Rod. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Declan. Nice Thanks to be here. Thanks for having me. Not at all, not at all, but just as I said in 
our introduction, it is genuinely of interest to any of us you know, who have ever written a paper in neurology right. just to get a few tips and a few back tricks. And what we very often don't get is tips from key people like yourself and your colleagues, the uh, statistical editors at European Urology. So yeah. um, can I kick off and just ask you a bit about that? First of all, tell us a bit about your own role uh, back in uh, at Ann Arbor. Yeah. And then we'll have a chat about uh, your role at European Urology Family of Journals. Sure. Um, thank you. So my role at University of Michigan is I'm a biostatistician, have been for about uh, 25 years or plus. Yeah. Um, initially started in the Cancer Center at Michigan uh, and then moved to the urology department. Uh, I run a team of about 13 statisticians. Um, I'm involved with a surgical collaborative called Music and, uh, and I help run the department too. So I'm an administrator as well. Wow, yeah. so you're kind of an honorary urologist. Just, yeah, <laughs> basically. So music, of course, is legendary to us. We, we've always admired the whole music uh, collective, but that's yeah. exactly the sort of project where having expertise like yourself and your yeah. colleagues is key to it. But tell us a bit about European urology then. Um, so I remember the earlier days of European urology, we had no senior statistical professional right. advice like yourselves, but now this is just a, an essential part of ensuring we get our research to the highest quality uh, from a methodological point of view, from an analysis point of view. So tell us a bit about what, what you do at European Urology. What's, what's your, your week like when you're working for us? Yeah, so I've been an editor for just over three years now. And uh, we, why I wanted to be an editor was we have this wonderful set of guidelines. We have now three that we published over the last uh, five years. First was just on how to do a review or how to write a paper, all the parts that need to be included with regard to the statistics. And then we had another one on figures and tables, and we have a brand new one from last year on causality. These guidelines are amazing, and it's kind of a recipe for how to do it, how to take care of the statistics that you're going to report. Um, so I personally wanted to learn them better for my own use, for all the trainees, the clinical trainees, the statistical trainees. I thought they would be a wonderful resource, and what better way to learn it than Absolutely. to be able to apply them. So that was the reason why I wanted to start with EU to begin with, but also being part of the preeminent journal in the world was an amazing benefit as well. So these are really important, uh, these papers. So, And I know from reviewing papers myself that it's uh, cringeworthy when it gets to statistical review and you're saying, yeah. kindly refer to our, you know, these key papers. So yeah. if you're out there preparing your paper or even more so preparing a project in advance and you're trying to set out your trial design, read these four key papers. They're very easy to find on the author information section of European Urology. But yes. there's almost no excuses for it now because they, these yeah. are like meant for these journals, uh, for urologists publishing in GU uh, areas. So. Yeah. Um, so that's a key bit of work, I think. Yeah. yeah, I would point out, though, and I included this in part of a talk I gave yesterday, that if you look at all the guidelines across these three papers, there's 109 of them. Um, and what I don't want for people is to be really intimidated by them. And I think there is a lot of intimidation. People think that they're going to go through this statistical review and it's going to be bloody and that it's uh, just not going to be a fun process. Um, the guidelines are meant to be helpful. I think it improves the quality of the work. We don't apply the guidelines typically at all to make reject, accept type decisions. It's all for improvement. Yeah. And so if people can start off with, there's no way people are going to memorize 109 different guidelines. I don't have 109 guidelines memorized. Uh, so just learn the big ones. Learn what you do often and, and what improves your work. And sometimes you're going to submit your paper and get the feedback and just learn for next time. And we did, on that uh, talk that Rod was doing yesterday, we ran a, a course here, European Urology run a writer's course at the EAU meeting, so here in Paris, it was a really well attended course. Yeah. And we can't go through all of the great tips you had, but I want to pick your brains about a couple of them. And one of them was, um, starting early your relationship with your biostatistician if you've got a project in mind and it doesn't have to be like a gigantic randomized trial but just have you've got a research question that you want to address it, you made the point like it's obviously so important yeah. to not be thinking about the stats after you've got some no. data no. so do you want to just that's like a classic mistake we've all made yeah don't don't come at the end don't come um, at the end don't don't come with the typical this is only <laughs> going to take you five minutes <laughs> yeah, i just need a p-value it, it never takes five minutes yeah the p-value like we're going to pull it out well, of no, our magical no you don't need to do anything fancy i just want a p-value right. Right, exactly. right, right, right. There's a couple of uh, good uh, videos online making fun of this process. Uh, no, it's, uh, you know, the problem, I said earlier, we don't typically get into accept, reject, but the very rare cases where it comes to statistical review and we do reject is when uh, there's a problem that can't be solved. Normally we're trying to fix things, but sometimes if there's an issue with the design of the paper, we can't fix that. Uh, if it's just a fatal flaw, fatal we cannot flaw. go back. If you've collected the wrong data, we cannot go back. You're just going to have to do it over. And so 
work with your sales session early, and they do a lot more than just analysis or providing the p values. Uh, they work on the study design. Supposed they work on what kind of data are you trying to collect? Yeah. Um, is what you're measuring what you think you're measuring? Is that what's important for what your yeah. clinical question that you're trying to answer? And um, when you walk away from those meetings, if you've had the chance, okay, we've tracked down a statistician at the university or the hospital, yeah. like your mind is transformed because, oh, and now there's a real clarity on how you're going to set your project up and get the data. And you've built a relationship with key people who are going to help you, you know, with managing the data and getting the data out of it. But right. as, as Rod says, you, you know, you, it's unrecoverable when you try and say, I just need a p-value on this data set up and we spent a year building up and then it can't be fixed to a high quality level for a journal of our standard, I think. Yeah, uh, one other aspect I think to this relationship, and I think building the relationship really truly is important, um, is the communication between the clinical investigator and the statistician. There's a translation layer and I always liken it to spoken language. So if you spoke German and I spoke Japanese, you know, we're going to struggle to be able to communicate. We have to figure out some middle ground in the same way with clinical investigators with a statistician. Statisticians are going to speak in math, clinical investigators are going to think more in terms of the science and the, and the clinical portions, and they need to be able to understand each other. If a statistician, uh, when we learn in school uh, how to fit a regression model, for example, it's A, B, C predicts Y, right? And, but if I know what variables A, B, and C are, if I know how they're measured, if I know the reliability of these, um, I'm going to do a lot better job statistically. I'm going to pick better methodology. I'm going to be able to better advise you if I understand that. So I ask my people, I work with John Way, a wonderful urologist uh, from the University of Michigan early in my career. Uh, he would come, we were working a lot on prostate biopsies. And I said, okay, and this is back in the days of the sextant biopsy. Yeah. And so I said, Draw, go to my whiteboard, show me what the prostate looks, looks like. Looks like, and, and where do these and needles go? What does LALBLM <laughs> mean? Where are these? And bless his heart, he must have done it 50 or 100 times, drawn a prostate. He must have been like, you really don't get it from the other 49 times? <laughs> but, but he did, he was patient with me. And, but in return, I was patient with him and then taught him. You know, so you're meeting with this clinical investigator. For statisticians, typically, you're not going to be the ones doing the presentations. You're going to send your clinical investigators to something like EAU. Um, they're going to go have to report on the statistics, and they need to know what they're talking about. They need to know what type of methodology you did, what were the gotchas, what were the things that you're going to need to convey to your audience to show that you did the proper um, approach statistically for your paper. My final question is, yeah. Do you know the link between the student tea test and the Guinness Brewery or <laughs> Guinness Pints? I do not. Do you not? No, educate Okay, me. I'm going to leave that one out there. It's, it's okay. my very in-depth knowledge of statistics uh, from an Irishman's point of view is that there's a very intriguing link between the student tea test and Guinness, my favorite drink when I'm back in Dublin. But um, you can educate yourself. Or maybe we'll find a place to have a pint of Guinness tonight and I can tell you all about it. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have time for on this month's edition of the European Urology Podcast. I do hope that you enjoyed the content. Please do subscribe, like, rate, review, and all that sort of stuff. We do love hearing from you, so if you have any comments and suggestions, please reach out through our social media channels. We'll be back next month with some more highlights from European Urology. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.